discussion around ethics and technology. I'm Elizabeth Perry with IDCA. Very happy to be back after the holiday hush. Uh, happy 2020 to all. 2020 has a nice ring to it. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. As a reminder, this show is recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel uh, on ubngo.com and on iTunes or any podcast platform you choose. Please follow us on Twitter at IDCAAB. I-D-K-A-A-B, on LinkedIn, Instagram, and share with your people. If you're joining us live and have questions or comments during the show, we'd love to hear from you. So feel free to dial the number on your screen anytime, and we'll do our best to get you in on the conversation. So the title of today's show is Investing in Ethical Tech, a 2020 Vision. Today's guest has written, worked, spoken, and taught extensively about ethics and technology, and he's also an investor uh, what about investing in ethical tech? Is there a place in the world for ethical startups? What does the future hold? Here to help us tackle those questions and more, it's my pleasure to welcome investor, author, speaker, educator, and pioneer, Tony Fish. Thank you. That's a nice welcome. Tony, welcome. It's an honor to have you here. Uh, thanks Thank so much for joining much. No, yeah. very excited. How, yeah, and what a great topic. Yeah, what a great, I mean, we've got to get right into this. We have so much to cover. So, but I want to give people uh, a, a chance to know a little bit more about you. You certainly got an impressive resume from MIT to INSEAD to writing books, lecturing, educating, founding companies and investing in them and helping them grow. Yes. So um, what got you interested in ethics and technology? Let's have a little background. Um, I suppose uh, what really happened, so when I was doing my master's some 30 years ago, um, I wrote my thesis on environmental management. And the reason I wrote it on environmental management, uh, because I thought the environment and our response to the environment was going to be a board issue. And I failed. Um, basically, they told me that the, the, um, the climate environment and uh, issues of principle and culture and ethics was not a strategic issue. It wasn't an issue that the board should take seriously, and they failed me. Um, and my tutor, um, uh, Richard Wilford, or Professor Richard Wilford, he fought for me and said, no, 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 you know, the environment is massively important. And so a lot of it came because I read Francis Kenkos' book, Costing the Earth, and it was trying to make I was trying to unravel where business and ethics, morality, climate, all sort of mash together. And now it's it's just frightening. 30 years later, you know, suddenly everyone's jumped up and down and going, oh, we've got to do it, we've got to do it. Yet there are an awful lot of people who have been doing it for a very long time. And mm -hmm. But the complexity of the issues still haven't gone away. Yeah, I mean, there's so, something to be said about the, the relationship between sustainability, you know, mm. climate, whatever and things like privacy and you know and people aren't getting the connection necessarily but you you're kind of a you know you're a pioneer um you wrote your what's what was your first book um so roughly every 10 years i've written a book uh the first one was um at the end it was sort of um in, in times of period where aol and and um CompuServe were, were ruling the waves. Everybody believed in the um, walled garden, the portal, the control of the user. So I wrote the antipathy of that, which was called Open Gardens as opposed to walled gardens. And my mum thought I'd written a book about, you know, going to visit Open Gardens. <laughs> so it's quite <laughs> funny. Uh, so it, it wasn't the best title, I have to admit. Uh, uh, but the whole idea was that open source is coming. Uh, we've got to go down a, a route of openness. So this is um, 1990, uh, yeah, 1998, uh, 1999, mm -hmm. year 2000. Um, so it was evident that we had to go down a very different path, but a lot of businesses believe that the control was more important than allowing the user um, 
uh, some thinking. Um, from there, 10 years later, I wrote a book called Mobile Web 2.0, which was uh, the year before the uh, iPhone came out. And it was pretty evident that um, the data services were going to come along, that there was going to be web um, access properly on mobile devices, that apps were going to rule the way. Uh, you had to have app stores. Uh, it was all, ev and I wasn't anybody particularly special. I just happened to write about it in a long form format, as opposed to lots of people who were talking about it. A lot of people knew, and it was evident it was going to happen. And, you know, we, we know the rest of the story. Mm -hmm. um, then 10 years ago, I wrote um, a third book, which was called My Digital Footprint. Um, but the subtitle of it or the sub license of it was really simple, which was uh, your privacy is somebody else's business model. Right. And here we are 10 years later going, oh, look, you know, we, we still haven't managed to get our head around what we've actually given up. Um, and that in itself introduces massive ethical dilemmas into um, businesses that operate with some of the people's data, but also for ourselves in the type of businesses we want to interact in. And mm -hmm. from my perspective, where do we invest? Right. So, yeah, I started reading that book. Um, I thought, you know, what an interesting concept. And I looked at the date. And it was 2009. Yes. And people aren't people didn't even know these things. So so you kind of like have ESP or some sort of thing going on because no. um, it very no. interesting. No, I, I think what's more interesting, exactly as you said, um, here we are in 2020, and it's that perception of future vision. And mm -hmm. I think it's the guy, one of the guys who, who was in NASA um, quoted, and somebody probably had texted in and tell us exactly who the quote was from. Um, Man is extremely poor at forecasting what they can do in one year because we mm -hmm. over overdetermine what we can do in one year, but we're massively poor at what we will do in 10 years. And the reason mm -hmm. it came about was basically, you know, launch that couldn't they get a man to the moon in, in, in the decades they did, but what they believed would happen in technology and things was never actually even happened today. So right. we have a huge perception. So 2020 is going to be a fascinating generation. And part of it's because um, the millennials are suddenly going to become a massively important force. And the reason I believe they're going to become an important force because the baby boomers really are exiting the market um, in terms of their powers, their controls, partly um, because they're, they're, they're starting to die. But secondly, their economics are being passed on to other people. They're losing the powers of control of businesses. Um, and this is going to skip my generation and go straight down. Um, and I think we're going to see enormous change um, in the way policies are formed and Greta and what she's doing in forcing people to look at issues um, is brilliant because so much of it's been controlled as policy by baby booners because they had the economic ability to control. And that, so in 10 years, I think we will see change beyond belief in the way we do things. Well, it's pretty exponential, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it it's, we can't keep up. I can't keep up. <laughs> But uh, that's why we well, need so, the next generation. <laughs> <laughs> and in your teaching and your lecturing, I just wanted to ask you one quick question about yeah. that. And I wonder, you, you have so many things going on. What's the most important thing that you teach? Um, so I, I, I'm back from a, a sabbatical. And part of that was to be able to read very widely. Um, so I read, I, I've been teaching AI and ethics uh, for a while. And I particularly teach at London School of Economics. And I've done some at London Business School. Um, and then University of Sydney and, and, and um, Bradford as well. Um, the, one of the, the, the big issues we face is the ethics and morally, morality that were taught as modern philosophy comes a lot from enormous amounts of history. The problem is that as conceptual frameworks was built from individuals creating a framework and then justifying it and presenting it, it being adopted and becoming you know, an acceptable way of explaining things. Um, what's happened in the last five to 10 years is suddenly we have functional MRI scanners um, so we can see blood flow in the blood brain. Suddenly we have um, the ability to look at your chemistry, your DNA. And modern um, philosophy is actually being built from data and the way that you behave, you react and you do things as opposed to the way we believe that that may have happened. So we're unraveling a lot of our beliefs and a lot of our feelings and a lot of our emotions back to chemistry 
and what that chemistry is and how it comes about, uh, which means fundamentally we've got to rethink what ethics and morality are and because we can base it now on factual data. So go back to the sabbatical. I read lots of books, which were effectively people's PhDs published as books, but everything was published in the last year. So it was about consciousness, AI, um, ethics, morality, um, the brain, the way it works, um, the gut, the influencing, just that whole sort of genre. And mm -hmm. man, there's some bright people on this planet. <laughs> including oh, yourself tony no, no no not compared to these people they're just they, <laughs> you know i'm just going to repeat their stories i you know i'm going to steal them and maybe make them more accessible but they are the brains well i think that's what's interesting about you and i, I sort of found you through your writing and um is that we need people like you who can make sense of some of these really complex um issues and you know technology and, and AI and self-driving cars and, you know, what's behind that and what's the morality and blah, blah. And, you know, and we need people to bring that down to sort of more layman's terms so that we don't get too heavy. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I suppose it's, you know, society has always needed storytellers. Yeah. And kind of like, and you know, your, your, your background as well is, is journalism and journalism in so many ways is getting the story and being able mm -hmm. to articulate that story beautifully so people can engage with the story. Yeah. Um, the issue we currently have is, uh, and it's a quote, I, I use it because my dad taught it to me, but I don't know where he stole it from, which is, you know, never let the facts get in the way of a good story. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the society we live in is very much more story driven than fact driven. And we've, uh, but the facts are there. And that is, that is definitely true. Sometimes we don't like the facts and therefore we prefer the story. And um, it just allows us to avoid actually some of the, the brutal reality of what's what's really going on. Right. Any good anecdotes you want to share about uh, your your you know talking to people or engaging with people about this kind of subject matter? Um, I, I think what's fascinating, and interesting that um, I'm spending quite a lot of time at the moment going around and talking to. Um, specifically executives on the boards of FTSE 100 companies and exploring with them um, what data really means for their businesses and how they will be running board meetings in 2025. And the question I pose for them is what will a board meeting look like in 2025, five years from now? Mm -hmm. And do you believe it's going to be the same or do you believe it's going to be fundamentally different? If it's going to be different, what will it look like? And that's really interesting because so many board meetings are predicated on finance data and suddenly they're being faced that actually by 2025 finance data will be one of a series of memes of data they need to be really deeply engaged with and it's the linkages between those data sets which is going to be their complexity and struggles and that hasn't unreeled itself yet um, because reality is they're going to be held accountable for it. And if you're going to be accountable and responsible for the decisions you make and it's going to be public and it's going to be traceable, there's going to be a very different attitude to the way, you know, effectively governance will run itself. Yeah, that's another whole thing. But, you know, yes. I, I want to I know. I mean, there's so much to, to, to cover and um, I kind of want to get right into the meat of what we're talking about, investing in ethical technology. There's been a lot of attention yes. to. Facebook, Google, other tech giants who are, you know, part of this surveillance capitalism that Shoshana Zuboff, you know, made popular as a term. And we talk about the misuse and the use of uh, personal information. And it's, it's remains virtually unchecked despite all of, all of this attention, despite the, the fines, which to me, I mean, you know, so what? You pay a fine, that's no big deal. Um, and the eroding trust online. Um, and that it brings me to the investment world too, where it seems like there, despite all this attention, there's little change as it relates to investment in ethical technology, privacy tech, uh, you know, whatever. Why is that? Um, is it still too soon for investors to get away from the space that made them wealthy? I mean, why, why aren't we seeing more investment? Um, th there's never an easy answer. Um, and 
part of investment philosophy itself is changing and it has continually changed. And uh, the old antage of, you know, from uh, Angel Seed, Series 1, 2, 3, ABC, um, was a model that was built on a series of economic thinking, uh, effectively justified by the baby boomers uh, for what they wanted to achieve, uh, but is actually fundamentally being eroded today. Um, there's a series of economic movements, which mean that actually you no longer need the same level of investment that was needed. And suddenly you can do an iteration. So you, you fund per ability to do something. The issues with some of these new bits of thinking and iteration is that you have to have a, an adoption very rapidly to carry on attracting. So it stops long-term pieces um, being invested into. Um, the piece you talk about privacy, I'm going to uh, nick a quote from Gam Diaz, who actually I saw today. Uh, we had oh, a bit of a catch up. Okay. He's been uh, on this show. Oh, he's brilliant. He's absolutely brilliant. If you're, if you're watching this, go back and watch Gam. He's just a genius as well as words. But he's I got know. This, he's got a great analogy he's using about um, privacy um, and veganism. So um, the, the old version of veganism was very much, you know, you, you went to at Hessian and nobody really wanted to go and eat Hessian because it had no flavor, nothing else. What's happened is veganism has now become actually incredibly tasty. So where people wouldn't give up their bacon sandwich because they absolutely loved the flavors, you can now have vegan food, which actually is incredibly full of flavors. And mm -hmm. as soon as you do that, people go, do you know what? I will order vegan food because I know it's gonna be really nice food. And actually I'm not particularly vegan or, pest or one of them, but I love good food. And actually if it's good food and it tastes well, I'll eat it. So what you see is, when it actually has value to the individuals and they can enjoy what they're doing, happy days, people will, will adopt and change. The right. issue with privacy, it, it's still not, you know, it, it's still Hessian. And this was his words, it's still Hessian, it's still not a, um, a, 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 a bacon sandwich. And until it become that tasty thing that you can, uh, as an analogy, as you can effectively enjoy, why are we worried about it? So let somebody else worry about it. And it's that, and I quite agree with that. It's a very interesting line of thinking, which just opens up going, yeah, it's not about the tech. It is about the engagement, about why you're doing things. Mm -hmm. And then you ask the question, um, and, and so many bits of research have been done on this, which is uh, go and ask the millennials, are you worried about privacy? And all the answers come back of, of no, just, you know, uh, we give away our data, we know what we're doing. And right. all the parents sit there going, oh no, this is an absolute travesty, it's a disaster. Then you ask the, the, the millennials, you say, how many uh, Instagram accounts you got? And they go, oh, five. What, you got five accounts for? I've got one for my mum and dad, because they, you know, that keeps them off my back. I've got one for my mates, because that's, you know, bits of mates. I've got one for my very special mates, happy days. I've got <laughs> one for my best buddy, and then I got one for my boyfriend, girlfriend, partner. So what they've done is compartmentalized their ability to get privacy by using the same technology. So their view about the ability to share and they like different services. So they like things like Snapchat because they know you can't take a, snap, a screenshot without the person knowing. So if you want to build trust with somebody and suddenly they're taking screenshots, you know, finished. Mm -hmm. And it's that. They, they've learned how to use the tech to actually completely preserve their privacy in a very different way. And it's mm -hmm. that interesting piece about, now they don't understand the terms, they don't understand other people own the data and what they can do with that data, but they've, they effectively have put themselves into a position where they've compartmentalized groups so they have exactly what they want. But Genius. that doesn't really, does, does that really give them privacy though? Or is it just different Depends profiles? On, it depends on what you mean by privacy at this point, you see. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you, when you think about Facebook, it doesn't matter how many profiles you have on Facebook. They're still going to create a shadow profile with your data, you know, and, and profile you and target you with ads and target you with, you know, memes or content or, or whatever. And I don't know, I'm just asking, I don't know if that, if that, solves any issues of privacy uh so uh, i suppose one of the the it's the back 
side of that story, which is um, that Facebook sits um, between what it does as a um, privacy piece, which is to you as the user, where they set a series of terms and then offer to you some ability to control what the community see as your data. So okay. you can restrict uh, through preferences who else sees your profile down to the point where nobody can see your profile. Mm -hmm. um, and those, you know, they're tremendously hard to find. They're stupidly hard to use. They're not always very clear. They keep changing. They're there. Okay. And, you know, the other big suppliers in the market have got the same thing. Uh, you know, yes, there is a pretense of control to the individual, but it's the backside of the story which matters, which is your data is now in the system and they can basically choose what to do with that data. It's their right. choice, what and how they monetize it. And so on one piece, we're crying for transparency on the relationship between Facebook and the users. Actually, where I'd like to see is we want transparency on how Facebook monetize the data on the back end. Now, right. I don't want to know the exact terms because that's commercially sensitive but it's who they have done deals with on what types of terms they've done it on. Not the exact terms, but the types of terms, because that right. gives us much more visibility of actually what's happening to the data sets. Okay. So back to the investment part. Um, yeah. Is there a place in your opinion for companies whose success does not rely on data mining or ad-based business models? I mean, we're still talking about, I just don't see okay, there's DuckDuckGo, they got investment. Um, but so why are they getting it and, and not others? And is there more, is there more room for more of those companies? Um, so, so let's step back to the baby boomers. Yeah. And yeah. what the baby boomers have handed to us as, 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 as you know, the, uh, the, the somewhere between 40s and 60s generation as opposed to the over 60s as baby boomers. Um, so they handed to us as parents is, was, you know, go buy a car, go get married, uh, go get a mortgage, buy a house, um, be happy in the job and all of, you know, get a pension. And there was this sort of um, very unique world they created, um, which had never really existed before, but they kind of like created it. And, you know, from where we know the pensions came in in 1940. For lots of people in terms of the healthcare, which came in after the second one, there's so many bits which came through from their generations. Um, the kids, the millennials are coming through um, who are rejecting all of those things. They don't want to buy cars, they rent. They don't want to own houses, they rent they, or lease. They're taking a very different philosophy. Um, yet the parents, the grandparents now are turning around and saying, but you know, it worked for us, it should work for you. And the kids are telling me, but it didn't really work for you. When you really boil it down, you thought it worked, but it, it only worked for a very short period of time and for a very few people. So they kind of like a very big fundamental change. Why has that become interesting? Because the millennials are obviously coming to the workforce and the work, they're coming to the workforce with a very different bunch of thinking. So as investors, um, you're finding investors are changing their sentiment, not because they're changing their sentiment, because the people who are starting to invest are changing. Classic example of this is BlackRock, you know, the, the largest pension fund in the entire world uh, as fund of funds. Larry Fink writes his um, annual letter every year. And this year's letter is absolutely superb because it sits there going, uh, we have joined as BlackRock. Um, most of the climate change organizations were doing that because we want them to start to tell us what these companies that we're investing into are doing. And if the company promises to do one thing and does something else because we've got an independent route back, we're, we're turning around and going, guys, you can't offer one thing and do something else. Now, I don't think that's Larry Fink or his executive team doing this. Mm -hmm. This is the 20 year olds who are coming in, who are now running, you know, the pension funds. They are running the funds of funds. They are fundamentally an entirely different series of thinking. So the investment philosophies are starting to change at every single level uh, from the large funds of funds all the way down to ventures. And the, when the kids are turning up, they don't want suddenly uh, let's go solve mass scale pain problems, which was effectively what everybody told as investment philosophy um, 
uh, for, for so many of the, the baby boomers, it's like, actually, we can now solve bespoke problems using a platform for everybody at scale using data. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're changing round, but they're saying, but to achieve that, we, we may or may not choose to do or get the benefits um, uh, in a different way in terms mm -hmm. of instead of direct cash, in terms of monetization data. But then they're turning around and saying, how does it become sustainable? And Sainsbury's is an interesting one in this, in terms of the UK supermarket who promised to reduce plastics. Now the data is coming through. They're not only um, haven't reduced plastics uh, in the full way that they kind of like promised they would do, but secondly, the technologies, them and all the other supermarkets are picking are more environmentally damaging than actually the plastics if they've continued with it. So the data is starting to say, guys, it's not good enough just to promise and not deliver. You've got to actually close the loop and create sustainable ecosystems which mm -hmm. is what you know the rap the business round table of the us so 150 of the biggest uss us uh, companies is saying we now have to have sustainable ecosystems so the old port of view of the value chain of yeah okay eventually you end up you know um uh, trying to get more value at the top by basically um uh, creating more pressure down the value chain doesn't work you've actually got to make the whole system sustainable so you need to give more margin to the value chain and the milk market's a classic where we've effectively got milk at production costs which are stupid but now in the hmm. new modern thinking we're going to start around to actually to create a sustainable ecosystem we need to make sure the farmers actually receive and the kids are coming in i say kids it's a terrible thing the millennials are coming in going actually you, the way you try to do this and just creating value for one party is not good enough we want to create value for lots of parties and create sustainability. And therefore that's why so much investment philosophy is changing because the people making the investment decisions and the people building the businesses are a, a completely different mindset. Happy days at last, super exciting. So you think that it's going for the better then? Oh, massively. Massively. Mass massively, yes. It's gonna take time, but massively changed. It's very exciting. Yeah, I, I mean, Absolutely. But, um, I'm going to go through some of these points that um, we talked about yeah. offline. Uh, impact investing. Joys of impact investing. So the, the and it's a really easy thing to search for in, on on any of the, the the search engines. The idea of impact investing is that I make a direct investment into something, and by doing it, I get a multiplier effect. So I impact a market and create change. Okay. Um, several problems all occur like that is um are you the person who's actually created the change have you accelerated the change actually a natural change may have happened you may have done nothing actually by you investing you may actually not create the change because actually you've stopped it happening and the issues that we've got with impact investing most definitely is this whole measurability of what we're trying to measure to impact and how we get that data back as a non-linear system back to ecosystems. Um, so the, the idea of impact investing is very good. We just have not got the level of sophistication to be able to actually understand because you know, effectively the ecology of each ecosystem is so complex and each business is not on its own, neither is any supply, that what you do in one thing has an unintended consequence. And at the moment, the impact investing problem is we don't know the unintended consequence of making the investment. Right. Much like and we have with maize, which we have with dried milk, which we have with plastic bags, many things are interrelated. And we, we, we kind of like want too much simplicity. And actually all the data is now coming through is actually we can start to deal with this complexity. Mm -hmm. So impact investing as a philosophy is going to change incredibly as we are able to sense and monitor data, which we were never, never able to do before. Now, do you think, let's talk about data for just a minute. Um, I mean, there's all kinds of regulation and there was GDPR, which sparked, you know, a lot of other different privacy yep. laws and regulations, yep. C CCPA yep. and in California. Um, isn't that going to make this whole data-driven economy more difficult to to succeed? Uh, so you've, you've, you've picked one particular part of data, which is the interface between um, a business and a consumer. 
mm-hmm. which is what that all those protections are about. Same in the Royal Commission, which came through in Australia, same as what's happening in Singapore. Um, it, it is a protection at the business to consumer level, the B2C. Mm-hmm. Um, it is there now that is one tiny, tiny, tiny piece of data. Uh, yet we seem to have run away in the view that that is the only set of data and it's the only thing that we should run with and exploit and everything else and therefore we've got to protect the input links etc 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 there's the whole b2b piece which is falls outside of it Uh, we've got the whole piece which is just internal data inside the organization so your hr data your your supply chain data all the rest of it which we can't like Mm -hmm. ignore Yet those data sets are massively important in changing both the design of the way you do processes and procedures, uh, but also in the way that you actually run your operations and find places you can automate to create better value. Yet, if we go back to the other piece, which is the round table where they're saying we have to create sustainable ecosystems, we are creating an enormous shift away from the pure uh, shareholder return we need to carry on delivering money we actually have to create sustainable ecosystems so yeah gpdr is a tiny 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 little bit of data but it's not all data and it's certainly a a set of data that needs certain protections but we've got obsessed with that is the only data source which is not a particular place to be right i mean uh, yeah and then a lot of people say that gdpr and these things don't really have teeth anyway because all they do is um, you know, impose fines on people. So um, uh, I wrote a piece uh, a while ago, which was um, how how should a regulator start to behave? And to pick your very point up, which is um, it's a point which we don't like to debate too much. Um, most businesses that are out there who are in G- GDPR coverage land um, effectively are or have created data business models which effectively exploit um, the data from the users for their own gain and if you termed where that business sits in the user's mind they sit in a position of exploitation and no trust but reality is we keep using the services because the services are useful so it's not about usefulness or value to us but we understand the exchange right Um, what the regulator has done with gdr is try to regulate businesses in that grouping now what branding does is allow companies to see be perceived as non-exploitative and trusted so they basically change their market position but actually fundamentally the business model still sits exactly exploiting data and non-trust where the regulator needs to be is rather than trying to regulate businesses which are in the non-trusted exploitative mode, they actually should be forcing businesses into the trusted and non-exploitative mode. Therefore, you regulate around businesses that create value for the users on the way users want to use them, not try to regulate in the wrong place. So I'd agree that it's the teeth and the, are not the wrong teeth, but they're keeping businesses in the wrong place. So Mm -hmm. how do regulators change their entire policy to actually think we want businesses to behave differently? The the motivation is not to change business behavior. And motivation is completely wrong. Uh, Example would be in, um, in the UK in 1974, um, we passed an act and it was called the health and safety at work act before 1974. Um, regulators had tried to create rules regulations policies all sorts of things to get businesses to to change their attitude towards health and safety work you know they wanted to protect people more all the right things you don't want people dying at work or being hurt maimed and anything else Um, people just didn't do it that's the reality directors it was a cost so what they did is in 1974 is they made it mandatory it became it became a criminal law if somebody died on your watch the directors could go to prison Overnight, what happened? Behavioural change. There was, you know, <laughs> directors no longer want, and they, they also forced it that directors could not delegate that responsibility. So you couldn't have, oh, I gave that responsibility for health and safety to X, Y, and Z. No, 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 no. You may have given the responsibility, but you are accountable. So mm-hmm. if that person dies on a watch, you as a director 
you are effectively, it's a criminal prosecution. You can end up in prison if it's proved that you're negligent. So if we come back to privacy, yeah. if we carry on regulating people just saying, you know, get better, we're going to fine you, no behavioural change. You turn yeah. around and say, if your privacy policy is X, Y, and Z, if you break your privacy policy, you go to prison. Right. How to create behavioural change of the businesses would be, you know, it, we would see change overnight. Now, and, and a lot of people are, are, you know, they're making it part of their political campaign in the U.S., say, you know, Elizabeth Warren, for example, wants to break up big tech. And uh, I don't know what she says about punishable by imprisonment, but a lot of people are talking about that as an option or a, a um, you know, a change in, in regulation like GDPR. Um, do you believe that that is a good thing? Um if we want to see behavioural change, yes. Uh, you know, it's it's a because the reality of today, there's no disbenefits directors to actually just breach it, and actually, you just look at Facebook, and you know, the valuation goes up when they get know the size of the fine, because they go actually, it's just a cost of doing business, and the value mm-hmm. they they, know, they valued it, and now they valued it. Actually, it's peanuts compared to the value of the business. Hey, keep going. Why why would you stop that? So there's no behavioral change. You, you, you haven't created a mechanism for behavioral change. Right. And do you think the investors are going to follow this? Like, I mean, you talked about this before about how, you know, if things are going to change in the, who is the actual person investing, um, you know, the things will change, but I still don't really know what I believe is going to change, if anything, in this whole like, way of investing. Or what to Uh, invest in. Yeah. um, And investors have always had um, methods of of filtering types of businesses that turn up at their doorstep. Um, And um, there was always a segment of business. uh, So the the four segments. So if you look at pain versus strategic as one axis, uh, say the X axis, and there's a Y axis, you look at um, frequency of use. So at the the top right-hand quadrant, which everybody loves to go to, which is actually the worst quadrant to go to, which is I'm going to solve the biggest pain for people, which is the most frequent because everyone goes, Oh, that's the place to go. But everybody does the same analysis. And if you do the same analysis, it works out that everybody's going to be hugely competitive. There'll only probably be one winner and you've got to back the winner. If you're going to make an investment return in that market because of competition. Um, really simple, really easy to understand. So as an investor, what you do, unless you've actually already got scale and proof, you avoid that market in spades. Right. Unless um, you get somebody who comes along with a non-conformative way of delivering something in that market. Airbnb, Uber, you look at the big guys. They are in there, but reality is they've done it in a non-conformant way, which is genius. But if you're yeah. just going to do it the same as everybody else, don't back it. Um, the other markets, which is the um, uh, top left-hand quadrant, which is high pain but strategic, is design. iPhone sits there, but not many people win. Yes, you make enormous amounts of money, and it's a very good market to find, but they're very, very hard to find. And you don't mm-hmm. see many, but happy days when you do. Bottom quadrant's luxury, because um, there's no pain and it's a strategic investment. Um, but again, huge barrier to entry, but if you can do it, huge investment returns. But you don't tend to find many. The bottom quadrant uh, on the right hand side, which is you're not solving many, but you're solving a high pain problem is is an individual unique thing to Elizabeth right now. But Elizabeth is different to, say, your sister or your best friend or somebody else. Um, And therefore, I can only solve it for one person. And that as an investment market was disastrous. But now that's become the platform and data market. So I can create an investment strategy very easy into that position. And now the question then comes back is, is it actually going to make a change to the way behavior happens? Mm-hmm. And that's part of the moral choices people are going through. Am I exploiting people or am I creating value by creating something more valuable for the user? So that whole right. segment is the place where most investors are looking to invest, not mm-hmm. into the high pain, uh, high frequency, which is, yeah, lots of businesses love it because it's low risk, but it's not because it's stupidly competitive. But yeah, that's, you know, it's 101 of, I suppose, how to position companies. Right. No, that's, uh, that's, thank you. That was 
that's interesting. Totally um, answers my question. Now you had mentioned um, to me again offline, um, which I thought was interesting and I'd like to get into this, what, why complexity and judgment are more <laughs> critical than returns? I, th I mean, that's fascinating. If you could answer that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah genius wouldn't it <laughs> <laughs> um uh, i suppose if we step back um um and most people have been through uh, business economics and business training and management training um through masters degrees mbas whatever um there was a fairly simplistic view about how you made decisions which were largely based on finance now mm -hmm. While you've got enormous stability, finance is one of the best ways to make decisions. But it, there's a predication you've got stability. And the predication of stability is that the market data you had last year is a good predictor of what's going to happen next year. And as long as that works, and therefore if you're in a large industrial business in 1950s, you could predict the next 20 years happy days. If you're in oil and gas, petrochemicals, you know, huge pharmaceutical industries, you're past data of performance from finance was an enormously good predictor of what was going to happen next and you know we've built enormous economic models on um past data as a predictor of future but slowly uh what we've been doing is accelerating 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 and that window of uh, 10 years of financing data actually was good predictor of next 10 years became five years for five years became three for three became one for one we can't even do a quarter by quarter now so finance as a single objective to be able to future forecast actually is now unreliable. So where the complexity mm -hmm. comes is we've now got a huge number, number of other data sources and we don't equally value other data sources in the decision making process because we like finance because we've been foregrounded into using finance as our decision tool. Uh, we've spent enormous um, time uh, making sure that the finance data actually it has providence and linearage and is very good. It's high quality, it's informed, it's regulated, it's audited, it's a da, 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 we've got it. The rest of the data, we haven't got that same level of confidence or trust in the data. So you're asking now for directors and executives to make decisions but it can't be finance data only. It's got to be in an amorphous mass, but the very data that's being presented to them may not have the same level of rigor as the data they have decided on in the past. And so the complexity comes in of you've now got a series of different data sets, which are probably not giving you an answer. They're giving you a series of possible outcomes and you as you know, as a senior executive have now got to bring your judgment, which is experience effectively, but you've got to bring judgment to go, what are the unintended consequences? What is the best probable outcome? How can I steer towards the best probable outcome? So you have these two really interesting human pieces coming through, which is the ability to deal with complexity and the ability to make judgment being the most important things as we go into this data world, because data will not give you an answer. Right. <clears throat> so when you talk about returns, you're talking about, you're not actually talking about the bottom line. You're talking no. about, you're talking about, okay. All right. Yeah. When bottom I think line, of yeah. Bottom line is, I, that's, it's one of these, it's fascinating that it could be an old antage that, you know, it stood <laughs> the test of time for a period and, you know, all of those wonderful things we learned as finance, you know, it's like, yeah, great. Well done. It's, they're not relevant now. Or they're, they're less relevant because actually you just haven't got that level of degree of reliability in it. Mm. Wow. Um, so we have a few minutes left and I think we're, we're doing pretty well here with our time. I want to bring this all together and sort of talk about, and you already have touched on this thing. I mean, here we are in 2020. I can't stop saying 2020 because it's such a magical 2020 vision and hindsight is 2020 and all these great things you can do with the 2020. Yep. Can we exist in our digital and physical worlds at the same time, safely and comfortably without destroying ourselves? <laughs> uh, I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> the answer has to be yes. And the answer has to be no. 
Yeah. And, and therein lies so many um, dilemmas for us as society. Uh, a question I posed myself, um, oddly enough, in my digital footprint um, 12 years ago was, um, at what point does the digital divide not become those people who have internet access and those who don't, which was the digital divide as a, you know, as a phraseology people had. Um, when the digital divide becomes um, Tony's data is worth nothing because I have no economic value. I have no disposable income. Nobody wants to market to me because I have nothing. I can't do anything with it. Um, as opposed to um, Elizabeth, who has enormous economic value. And actually, the mobile operator is going to give you a free phone. Your telephone, your um, your uh, premium TV provider is going to give you free TV because they can make more money off you by your disposable income and being able to track advertising to you and your spend. So the rich effectively get richer and the poor get poorer. And here we have this, how do we create equality in this digital world that the people who kind of like, whose data doesn't have value because they don't seem to have an economic value are equally valued in the digital because that's a level of protection that we've got to come to, which gives people a far more economic stability, which we're not going down. We're going down there. Let's just go after the rich and wealthy and give them more for free <laughs> rather than because they've got disposable money. It's like, is that, is that the policies we should be setting? Yeah. I've got a question coming in to me right now for you. Um, Josiah asks, what are the other things he thinks or you think boards will be rated on? Yeah, great question. Uh, and it is a really good question. So the, the thinking goes forward and says, uh, by 2025, we're going to have very different board meetings. And to me, I think the biggest thing is going to be this held to accountability. And I love what Greta Thurberg is doing in creating um, a different debate and dialogue about the environment. So um, Sainsbury's putting out a piece which says we're going to use less plastics, but then being held account for their plastic use. Is this level of transparency and governance which boards are going to be held accountable for? So at the moment, they're held accountable for finance and the sustainability but there's a pile of rules which says, you know, as a listed vehicle, as a listed company, you must have sustainability for this period of time. If you're publishing and you're a private company, there's no real rules about your long-term survivability other than your investors are going to, you know, basically demand certain ways in the way PLs are done. So we've got a series of better data, which is going to bring more accountability. Um, one piece we've got to be uh, focused on as a society is the way standard accounting practices have been modified by the big accounting firms, which allows an inconsistent view by the way reporting now happens. So effectively, people can distort the reporting to serve their own purposes. And we need to get back to a level of how is the real numbers doing in the, the accounts, but then make sure we don't introduce the same biases into all the rest of the data, which would be valuable for us to understand how and if we want to engage with those companies. So it's a great question. Uh, to me, it will be around the ability to see more transparently into the core data, which makes mm -hmm. the business um, perform against what it says it's going to deliver. Good answer. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a fascinating question too. It is. Um, it's a great question. Yeah, it's a great question. Thanks, Josiah. And we are running out of time, which is, you know, hey, which mean it's good and bad because it means I can ask you to come back and continue Thank this you. conversation, which would be great. And uh, and I, I want to take a few moments in the spirit of this new year and this new decade to talk about or to tell you about a movement that's underway in cyberspace on ITCA. Uh, it's a group for news and discussion, and I'd love for you to join and, and sort of talk to people because people are going back and forth. It's called Privacy 2020. You can find it on IDCA. You just have to go on, get yourself a, a free account, and, uh, and do some back and forth, hear some news, uh, and share your voice. Tony, what message would you like to send 
to sure. mess uh, to you know people that are curious about their digital privacy or ethical technology oh uh, one message would be is i suppose it's it's how do you want to be held account for the promises you make how would you expect others to be held account for the promises they make and I, that's a debate over a either a cup of coffee, a glass of wine, a, a water, whatever you want to do, but bring people together because it will open up different people's perception about what you want and others want. And it's not there's right and wrong. It's just, we haven't debated it. And yeah, that would be a really super thing to go away and, and discuss. Yeah. I would, I would love to, uh, I would love to hear more about this. So we're going to wrap up, but um, listen, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it was a great conversation. I hope we weren't too, uh, I hope we were able to get into, you know, the meat of things enough. I think we did a good job at answering all these questions people uh, have put out there. Um, if you're not familiar yet with IDCA, please visit us at www.idka.com. Sign up for a free personal account. Bring your people, uh, your organizations, communicate, collaborate with colleagues, friends, and people that matter. Uh, it's your world, free from algorithms, ads, fake news, and people you'd rather not hear from. Any questions, please don't hesitate to, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, you can find Tony on Twitter. Just help me out, Tony. Tony at Fish. Tony Fish, just no dot, right? That's so website. easy. Yeah, the website is Tony.fish. And you can find him at mydigitalfootprint.com, which yep. is also a fascinating thing. And you can find some of his stuff on Medium. Just Google it. It's There's a lot out there. So thanks again, everybody. Have a great morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are in the world. And we'll see you again in the next Good Tech. Thank you.